Good, thank you. Take your Bible, if you will. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter number 22. Acts chapter number 22. I appreciate you being here. We've been going through the book of Acts and we made it to Acts chapter number 22. The Apostle Paul, he's traveling to Jerusalem. He met a prophet, a prophet named Agabus in Caesarea. And the prophet uh, tells him, basically saying, hey, Paul, you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound, you're going to be imprisoned, and it is going to be bad. But Paul believes it's the will of the Lord, the will of the Lord be done. He traveled to Jerusalem, met with the church, and uh, boy, the church was excited about the things of God. But after the church service and met with them, he went to the temple for seven days. And at the end of seven days in the temple, the Jewish people noticed the Apostle Paul. And that's when the persecution began. They drug him. They beat him. They did all sorts of things. There was a stir in all the city. And you imagine the city of Jerusalem. People are wound up. Uh, the Jewish people are angry with the Apostle Paul. It, they're, they're so wound up, eventually some of the, the officials, the city officials hear about it, and they get soldiers to go there to break things up. They uh, grab the Apostle Paul out of them. They begin to lead Paul to the castle. Paul's on the stairs, and he beckons with his hands. And then he asks, can I speak to the Jewish people? They're following there. And he holds up his hand, and he begins to speak to the Jewish people in the Hebrew language, and he gives them his testimony, his testimony. Yesterday, it was in the afternoon, and uh, there I was with my family and my wife and my kids, and I just had a great idea. I, I just had this uh, thing come over me, and maybe you would never do this, but boy, I just wanted those uh, a cheese and steak tokita from 7-Eleven. I don't know why, but that just came to my mind, so I said to the kids, I said, kids, Mandy, should we go? And they came with me. We went over to the 7-Eleven. We got out there, went in there. My wife got a Slurpee. I got two steak and jack taquitos. Uh, my daughter, Anna Joy, she got a cheeseburger dog, whatever that is. And then uh, they made pizza right there. And uh, man, we looked like a big old bunch. And as I'm waiting for my taquitos right there, my kids are chomping away eating. And I asked them, I said, did you pray? And they said, oh yeah, we prayed. I don't know if they did or not. But I said, let's pray. So I stopped right there, middle of 7-Eleven, and I said, Lord, thank you so much for the food that you provided us. And I said a prayer, and I said, in Jesus' name, amen. And this man who was walking in, he said, man, I haven't seen that in a long time. And it led to a conversation. My son Dan gave him a gospel booklet and began to talk with the man, and he's gone through some struggles, and I began as best as I could to give my testimony as best as I could. my test. That's what the Apostle Paul, in a unique situation, this unique situation where the people want to hurt him, want to kill him, he gets up and he begins to give his testimony. Let's stand, if you will, for the reading of God's word. What I'm going to do is, if you will, I'm going to read verse number 40 of chapter 20, 21. That's the last verse. And then I'm going to continue reading the first two verses of chapter 22, and then what we're going to do is we're going to read every other verse until verse number 8. And it'll make sense as we go along. I'm going to read verse 40 of chapter 21. It says, And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with a hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Then we go to chapter 22, verse 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence and he said. Now we're going to read verse 3. This is where he begins to give his testimony. Let's read verse 3 together. Ready? I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem, for to be punished. And it came to pass, 
that as I made my journey and was come nigh into Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Read verse number eight with me. And I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. What, what a tremendous scripture. Paul, in the midst of a difficult situation, he just got beat. Uh, boy, the whole city's in an uproar. He, he's ready to be led away, really an escape from the persecution right there to the castle. And he stops and he tries to bear his soul and give his testimony to the Jewish people. Paul had a testimony the title of the message this morning is, What is Your Testimony? And think about that. What is your test? Do you have a testimony? Do you have a testimony of a time when you trusted Christ as your Savior? And then not only do you have a testimony, are you open to give your testimony even in difficult circumstances like the Apostle Paul did? Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you, and I'm thankful for the Apostle Paul's testimony. And in his testimony, and it's obvious he didn't point people to himself, he pointed people to you. Lord, I pray that you help us to be a church filled with people who have a testimony, a time when they can remember back when they trusted you, and you alone is their only hope for heaven. But then, God, I pray that you help us not only have a church filled with people who have a testimony, but I pray that you help us to be a church filled with people who are willing to give their testimony to people. Lord, I pray that you please bless. We need you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What is your testimony? Oh, my. There's so much here. And by the way, praise God for the, the word of God that guides us and directs us. And in reality, this morning, there is a sermon inside of a sermon. And I just want you to see something, and I don't want to go over it, but look with me back at, at chapter 21. I want you to look at chapter 21 and verse number 10, if you will. Chapter 21, verse number 10, chapter before. And it says, And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named... Agabus. That was very good. We got one, Agabus. And so I don't know how you pronounce that, but if we all say it together, it'll sound good. And so Agabus, ready? Agabus. And so Brother Jay's a little bit, uh, you know, he's uh, right there, quick, right there. All together, Agabus. Very, very good. One more time just to make sure we got it right. Agabus. There was this prophet who began to tell uh, Paul, you, you're going to Jerusalem. You, by going there, you're going to be bound. You're going to be imprisoned. And that prophecy was simply history written in advance. As you continue the story, the Apostle Paul said, the will of the Lord be done. Sure enough, as you continue reading there, the Apostle Paul went to Jerusalem and he was bound and he was in prison. I want you to notice something in the Bible. Go to Isaiah chapter 46, if you will. History or prophecy is simply history written in advance. Prophecy is history written in advance. The Bible is a book of prophecy. If you look at Isaiah 46, I'm going to read verse number nine. It says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Woo! That is an awesome scripture. I am God. There is none like me. There, there's not, nobody like God. God who created the heaven and the earth. Our God is a powerful God. Our God is amazing God. Our God spoke and uh, man into existence. He spoke and there was a sun and moon and stars. There was airs. There was the grass. There was the trees. There was the animals. Our God is an amazing God, a powerful God, a wonderful God. He made the cow and now we have hamburgers. Our God is good. Praise the Lord. Hey, we got an amen finally after that. But our God is a good God. And that's what Isaiah is saying. There is, there is none like me. But then verse 10, declaring this great God that we have, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. 
In other words, our great God, he declares the end from the beginning. From ancient times, he said, this is what's going to happen. And when God declared this is what's going to happen in the future, it's as good as done. In other words, what God says is going to happen. Prophecy, the prophecy of the Bible, it's history written in advance. What God says, it's as good as finished. You, you go back to the Apostle Paul as you read Acts chapter 21. Boy, that Agabus, he prophesied. He said, hey, you go, you're going to be bound. You're going to be in prison. Sure enough, as he goes to Jerusalem, it was exactly as the prophet said, the prophecy of the word of God right there. He went, boy, uh, he was there for seven days. He went into the temple. Persecution came. The whole city's up in an uproar. Look at chapter 21, verse number 26. And Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple. Skip to verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, laid hands on him. And that was just the beginning of the persecution. Look at verse 30. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple. Verse 31, look at this. And as they went about to kill him, Oh, just like the prophecy of Agabus, prophecy is just history written in advance. Boy, they grabbed him as you read the rest of it. They beat the Apostle Paul. Yet Yesterday, we had a big group of us led by Brother Bill Osmond. We went to downtown Norfolk to try to give the gospel out. And me and my group, we got out of the van. We parked in a parking garage, went down and there was a, a, a group of people that was rallying for a certain cause, and uh, they were going to have a little parade uh, through downtown Norfolk, and uh, they had a reg registration table where they're going to register the people, or people had registered, they were going to have a sit-down sit meeting. Anyways, I walked over to the registration table, and the lady said, what's your name? I said, Matt Netesheim. And the lady looked up and said, what? I said, Matt Netesheim. She said, oh, N. And she began to look it up. And after a while, she said, I've just been shaking her head a little bit. I said, I'm not there, am I? And she said, no, you're not there. And I said, I didn't think so. And I took out a gospel track, and I said, I, I'm the pastor of Chesapeake Baptist. I'd like to give you this. I gave that one, and I had another one to the next person. As soon as I did this, this lady from the side grabbed me on the arm, and she said, you can't do that here. And she was fired up a little bit. I was a little nervous right there. She was a big woman about to punch me or something like that. And so... Anyways, it was my time to move on out and to go. And so we went out in the community there, and that was a blessing. About an hour later, their meeting was done, and they were steading up in their parade line. And we had to go through the parade line to get to our, our vehicle right there. So I said to the guys, I said, oh, I said, here, our goal is just to get one gospel booklet to, you know, at least somebody as we go through there. I got through there. I got my one gospel booklet to one. And then my Dan he got right in the front of the line and he started handing them out as they go like this, one to another right there. And I was so thankful for that right there. But this persecution that maybe I served, gotten one little person a little upset with me is nothing compared with the Apostle Paul went through. The Apostle Paul was beaten. They wanted to kill him. Boy, this whole city was in an uproar over the Apostle Paul. By the way, did I say prophecy is history written event? I didn't want to get far from that. Because later in the afternoon yesterday, I, I talked to my dad. Well, we got that new piano over there and that organ. I was so excited about that. I was talking to my dad. We were talking about the blessing of, of how God has blessed us with some wonderful, uh, amazing musical instruments in our church. God is so good. And we were celebrating that and thanking the, the Lord for that. Then our conversation somehow drifted a little bit to the problems of the world. Hey, Dad, my dad's watching this morning. Boy, our, our world is full of problems and difficulties. And, and me and my dad, looking at those difficulties, we can get wound up. We can get fired up about some things. And we were starting to get a little fired up about some issues. And then somehow the subject turned, and we began to talk about prophecy. We began to talk about the future. We began to talk about how the Bible says, in the end, we're on the winning side everything's going to turn out great. Hey, we're, we know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We've been saved by the blood of the crucified one. 
and that conversation that was going where we're starting to get wound up, all of a sudden we begin to celebrate, think about, hey, the Lord is in control. And we got on the subject of one day God is going to, to, to rapture or, or catch up the believers up into to heaven. And uh, my dad said, uh, when my generation is, is finished right there, that's when the rapture is probably going to take place. And I said, well, dad, there's no hope for me. You're going to live way uh, longer than me. And he, he basically agreed with it. Thanks, dad. And uh, killed me off. And, but, but you understand, that prophecy is history written events. God has given you and me the history, the future history, what's going to happen. And it'll comfort you. It'll strengthen you. It'll encourage you. Boy, I want to beg you and plead with you, church. Go to the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Don't be afraid of the prophecies. Boy, read them and say, God, give me understanding. And then no, don't doubt the Word of God. Boy, believe it. It's good as done. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I wanted to read some scriptures because there, there is in Revelation chapter 20 about the angel came down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Woo! We're on the winning side. And then in Revelation 21, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. It talks about the holy city, New Jerusalem. And it describes it as a bride uh, adorned for her husband. And then it says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Boy, the, the Bible, boy, it'll comfort you and it'll strengthen you. It's as good as finished. There is coming a day we are on the winning side as Bible believers. Now, back to the sermon. If you'll go back with me to chapter uh, 22, if you will. Chapter 22. Yeah, there we go. Chapter 20, the book of Acts. And if you go just before that, chapter 21, look at verse number 39. I'm going to read this to you. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no, no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given them license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and the point, point number one of the sermon is Paul had a testimony. Paul had something to say. And, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, sneak up on you this morning, but I pray that you have a testimony. And when I speak of a testimony, I'm going to pray and, and beg that uh, you have a time in your life when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your only hope for heaven. Boy, Paul had a testimony, and then, and not to sneak up on you, but I want to really encourage you, as the apostle Paul did, he was willing to share his testimony, give his testimony. This was not a group of people that were very kind or very nice. This was a group of people that were hostile towards the apostle Paul. Paul had a testimony. Now, as we think about that, Paul had a testimony. His testimony did not point people to Paul Paul had a testimony that pointed people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. Paul had a testimony. He didn't point people to himself. He pointed people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 22, and uh, I'm going to start in verse 1. Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they had heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. And then as you continue on there, in chapter, oh, I lost my spot here. I had my notes right there. Chapter 22, verse number three. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. And I persecuted, look at verse four, and I persecuted this way unto the death. And as you read that, He's given a testimony that he was a sinner. He's given a testimony that he was imperfect. And as you go through there, Paul's not giving a testimony because he's perfect. Paul's not giving a testimony because he is wonderful, but he's giving a testimony of the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's vitally important because some of you, when I get to the end, you ought to give your testimony. You'd be like, oh, I don't want to give my testimony. I'm wretched. I don't want to give my testimony. I'm, I'm imperfect. I don't want to give my testimony because I have too many problems. Well, uh, join the crowd. 
Boy, Paul, Paul had problems. He said in the Bible, oh, wretched man, not that I was, but oh, wretched man that I am. And you know, if you have to wait to give your testimony until you're perfect, you're in trouble because you'll never be perfect, but we do serve one that is perfect, the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, he gave his testimony. Paul had a testimony that pointed people to Jesus. Paul had a testimony that pointed people to Jesus. We live in a funny world. And uh, there is a thing called commercialized Christianity, and it is abundant in the world today. Commercialized Christianity. We, we have a Bible-believing Christian. That's what we are. We're Bible believers. We don't point people to ourselves. We point people to Jesus Christ. And part of the commercialized Christianity, they, they're having a big new contemporary concert series that's coming to the, the town near you and going across the, the United States. And some of the biggest names ever in pop contemporary Christian music are going to be singing. There was an advertisement for it. And the advertisement, when you read it, and it's amazing, if you pay this much money uh, extra, this is your ticket price, if you pay this extra money, you can sit close and be right next to the singer and then the name's the name. If you pay a little extra money, you can get up on the catwalk uh, where the singer's going to sing. I, I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. And if you pay a little extra money, you can get so-and-so singers, uh, you can get their merchandise, you can buy their merchandise before their merchandise goes on sale. So if you pay extra money, you can get their merchandise before it actually goes on sale. That's a good one. And uh, man, they, they, they make some money. And, and then the, the whole advertisement, it says this popular singer, uh, uh, music is sung uh, by 30 million people every Sunday in churches. And, and it really breaks your heart because the commercialized si uh, Christianity, the commercialized uh, music industry, Christian music industry, eventually it points people not to Jesus Christ, but it points them to themselves. And, and that's a hard statement, it is, but the commercialized Christianity is not really Christ-honoring, it's self-honoring. And boy, it's a sad, sad state when the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians of all time, he's saying, I'm a wretched sinner. Don't look at me. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. That's biblical Christianity. I must decrease. He must increase. Amen. Boy, we need an amen on there. Boy, a Bible-believing church like us, boy, I must decrease. We must, we must, I got it wrong. I must decrease, okay? You must decrease, decrease, but he must increase. You understand the thought process right there. We don't want to point people to ourselves. We're sinners, but we have a wonderful Savior. Continue on, chapter 22, if you will. And you look at this, in verse number six, and it came to pass that, as I made my journey, was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell under the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he answered, and I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And he's given a testimony and right there he gives a testimony of how Jesus changed his life, how Jesus saved his soul. By the way, your, your testimony, boy, your testimony needs to include Jesus Christ. If you have a testimony without Jesus, I question whether you got a good testimony because as, as you read the Bible, the only way to heaven is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans, the book of Romans is really a roadmap to heaven. In chapter one of the book of Romans, he writes all these terrible sins. And at the end of chapter one, you're like, man, that is bad. Oh, that's horrible. I can't believe somebody would ever do something like that. Then chapter two, verses one and two, it, it begins to say, hey, you the person who's judging condemnest thyself for thou doest the same things likewise. And all of a sudden he turns it on that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And then eventually it leads to for the wages of sin is death. And you begin to realize that, boy, we're destined to die and go to hell to pay for our sins. But then he says, hey, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal. That's the old, old story. And oh, church, sometimes we hear it so much. Oh, we forget how wonderful it is. It is the gospel. It's the good news. It's what saved your soul. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Do you have a testimony? 
Do you have a time when you can look back where you knew you were a sinner destined for hell, your only hope was heaven, not your good works, not your goodness, not your, your uh, tithe money or your baptism. Your only hope for heaven was Jesus. And you said, Lord, save me. Boy, do you have a testimony when you trusted Christ as your Savior? How many have a testimony when you trusted Christ as your Savior? I hope so. I hope so. Boy, have a testimony. Paul had a testimony that pointed people to Jesus Christ. Then I want you to look a little bit further here in chapter 22. <laughs> this is uh, pretty amazing as you begin to read it. Look, look at, at me with uh, me at verse number 20. Are you there, 20? This is the end. He's given his testimony and he says, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And you can read these, this chapter, and I'm not doing it justice this morning, but part of Paul's testimony is he looked and told about some of the problems he went through after he trusted Christ. You look in there where he went to Jerusalem. He mentions that a little bit earlier. We went to Jerusalem and the apostles rejected him. And the apostle Paul trusted Christ as Savior, but doesn't mean every part of his life was great. Didn't mean that he didn't have uh, trials and difficulties. Like the book of Job, life is, a, uh, life is a few days and full of trouble. And we think about our days this side of eternity, there are struggles, there are difficulties. There are times when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And, and part of your testimony that you can give is God's mercy. Well, you're imperfect. You're trying to live for the Lord but you're not, you're not perfect, but we have a perfect God. You're here this morning. Boy, you made it to church this morning, but I'll tell you what, if we had to live perfect lives to get to church on Sunday, none of us would be here. I'm just saying, we're, we're imperfect. If you had to have every pure thought in your mind for a week to go to church on Sunday, you'd be in trouble because you don't have pure thoughts all the time. You should, you should try, amen? Boy, if, if every time the Holy Spirit pricked your heart to do something, and you had to, to be spirit-led all the time to be able to go to church and live for, it's not true. We're, we're imperfect people. We live in an imperfect world, but God who is rich in mercy. And Paul gives a testimony and he's telling the people, hey, you, you, you understand, I once persecuted just like you did. Do you understand? He says to you, hey, you persecute, you just beat me. I was there once. I did that once. He didn't say I'm better than you. Do you understand that? He said, I've been there. Boy, I was on the wrong path before. I was wrong. Jesus saved my soul. And after I got saved, there was still some struggles, but this is the good life living for the Lord. By the way, it is the good life. It is struggles sometimes and difficulties sometimes, but serving the Lord is good. Now, this is the last point, if you'll look with me. And I want you to look at verse number 22. It says, and they gave him audience unto this word, that means they listened to him, and then lifted up their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. <laughs> you know, he gave them te their testimony, but the end result was not what I would want. Kill him. <laughs> we heard what you said, Paul. He's not fit to live. Kill him. And uh, some of you have a testimony. Most of you raised your hand and said you have a testimony. Time we trusted Christ your Savior. We would all agree that we should give our testimony. But in reality, some of us would say, I, I would give my testimony, but it won't make any difference. They won't listen to me. And that, that's not a reason to not give your testimony. I, I would give my testimony if they listened. Paul gave his testimony whether people listened or believed or they didn't believe. And I think this is very, very important. Sometimes we get the results and we say, well, I would if the results were this. Forget about the results, just give your testimony. Forget the results, just give your testimony. Here this time, Paul gave his testimony. He's bearing his heart. He's sitting there on those stairs right there, having been whipped. He's tired right there. Uh, probably he's like, Boy, I just escaped from my life. I almost died right there. He holds up his hand. He begins to give his testimony. The results weren't good, but praise God he gave his testimony. Praise God he tried. Yesterday, as we were out the bat, we went to downtown Norfolk, and there was a train station. We'd been there several times before, and uh, went to the right up the train. There's these benches, and my, it's probably been a year and a half since I've been out there. It's changed a little bit. 
there was a lot more homelessness than I've seen the last time I was there. And uh, as we were going uh, across, across the street right there, I was inviting somebody to church, and uh, all of a sudden this man, who is obviously a homeless man, he was the jolliest homeless man ever. He said, hey, I want one of those. And he was on a bench. And so I said, I'm coming, I'm coming. And the man's name was Kirby. And I got to talk to Kirby. He's a very interesting man. I sat down there on the bench with him. He smiled from ear to ear. He's 63 years of age. And I said, Kirby, you know, how do you make money? He said, oh, I got Social Security. And uh, he's happy. He says, yeah, I'm getting a raise in January, $94. And, and I said, well, what bills do you got? He said, the only bill I got is my cell phone. And he's like, he's happy. And uh, he's joyous. He's a funny guy. And uh, I began to talk to him about a lot of different issues and everything. I said, well, what about, you know, sleeping out in the cold? Don't you ever get cold? And he laughed. He said, no, I never get cold. <laughs> and uh, we talked about a lot of different issues. But eventually, the conversation led. And I said, Kirby, let me tell you what happened to me. And I began to give my testimony about how somebody invited me to church and I went to the church service for the wrong reasons and eventually somebody asked me that question, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? And it, it was amazing because he meant to ask questions. He said, I'd like to know for sure if I'd go to heaven. And I began to give him the gospel, how we're all sinners, how, boy, the price for our sin is hell. Jesus paid that price. At the very end of the long conversation, I said to Kirby, I said, Kirby, if God's offering you that gift of eternal life, would you accept that? He said, absolutely. And uh, at the end, he bowed his head and he asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save him. Praise the Lord. Now, now I wish it was all like that. Uh, right after that, there was a, a lady, she's 75 years of age. She was on another park bench over there. She came walking to up and she said, I was waiting for you to come talk to me. And uh, I said, oh, I'm sorry, man. I was, uh, just got done with Kirby. Here's a, uh, one of our gospel booklets right here from Chesapeake Baptist Church. I sat down. She didn't want to sit down. And it was hot outside a little bit. You remember the sun? And so we had to move another one to get out of the sun. And I began to talk to her. 75, 75 on the streets. A nice, sweet lady. Boy, her life forever changed at like 68 years of age. Some things went wrong with her family. She didn't want to be on the streets. She didn't want to be in the situation that she said, but her, her life is just that way. And I said, what's your dream? And uh, she said, well, my dream is just one day to have a little house uh, and a little bed and uh, to be able to sit there and be able to just read some books in my peace and quiet of my house. That was her, that's her dream. And uh, as I began to talk to her about different things, she talked about a church she grew up going to. And then I gained, began to give her my testimony, very similar to Mr. Kirby. And I said, Miss Elizabeth, let me tell you about the time that I went to church and somebody asked me the question, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? A long story short, she wasn't. She listened to the whole gospel presentation. We're all sinners. And I asked her at the end, I said, Miss Elizabeth, do you understand you've sinned? Oh, I, I understand I've sinned. Do you understand the price for your sin would be hell? I, I believe that. I said, do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sin? She said, I believe he did. And I believe he's God. I said, well, do you understand it's Jesus and Jesus alone without your goodness that will get you to heaven? She said, I just don't believe that. I just believe that, uh, that I've been taught that I have to go to confession and confession is my entrance into heaven. And, you know, a sweet lady, nice lady, my testimony that I gave, the results don't matter. I wish she would get saved. You understand, I wish that everybody you talk to who's never trust Christ would trust Christ as their Savior. But, but it's my job to give my testimony. And again, God works out the rest of the details. Your testimony, you have a testimony. You have, and your testimony is not about how great you are, because you're not. Except my wife. She's wonderful. Uh, but we're, we're not great, but we, have, we all have a great God who we're testifying about who saved our soul. And so when you give your testimony, you have a testimony, boy, as God opens a door, and I pray opens a door this week for you to give your testimony as best you can about what God has done for you. What has he done for you? Saved you from hell? By, by dying on the cross for your sins, gave you the gift of eternal life, not because of your goodness, but because of his mercy. Boy, he saved you, he saved you, he saved you. Boy, do you have a testimony? Boy, I want to encourage you to give your testimony. Paul had a testimony. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Just thinking about how you use the Apostle Paul and 
it's easy to point out what a great man and a great Christian he was. And he is a good man, but he's a sinner just like we all are. And I pray that you help us as a church full of imperfect people always remember how we were saved. And the only way we're saved is through your precious blood. Then, Lord, I pray that you help us to, this morning to look at the Apostle Paul's example of giving his testimony. I pray that you help us to have the courage to give our testimony, a testimony of when we trusted you as our Savior. And I pray that because of that, there's going to be times when people do believe. But in reality, there's going to be times when people don't. But God, I pray that you help us to not worry about that, but help us to give our testimony. Lord, we pray right now if there's a soul here that's never been saved, they don't have a testimony, that they realize their only hope for heaven is you. Please bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.